Middle Eastern patch of sand that promises the best of everything, from hotels and shopping to vibrant nightlife. In one generation, Dubai has transformed itself from an Arab fishing village into an international travel hub for business and pleasure. If you fly into Dubai today, it looks like a Middle Eastern version of Las Vegas or Surfers Paradise. But behind the flashy facade are some brutal traps for the unsuspecting. Qantas is now diverting hundreds of thousands of Australians through Dubai on their way to Europe, but what you don't see in the Qantas brochures is an explanation of what can happen to you in Dubai. A young Australian couple um, sharing a hotel room um, can be arrested for adultery. If that couple are homosexuals, the consequences are even more severe. There have been women who've been gang raped there who have then been convicted of engaging in adultery and, and had prison terms imposed upon them. It may look like a Middle Eastern version of Las Vegas, but it's very far from that. The glittering Miracle City has a legal system anchored in the Dark Ages. Justice can be cruel and capricious. Guilt or innocence can be arbitrary. And in a land where money is king, some of the worst crimes are financial. Find yourself accused of fraud or even bouncing a cheque and you're in for a rough ride even if you're innocent. Trust in through the front door with a few people yelling at you as you're entering, good we've got some white meat. <laughs> you're certainly, being an accountant, you're not really trained for that. Tonight we go inside the terrifying five-year ordeal of Australians caught in the quicksand of Dubai justice. What can we do? Who do you go to? That's, um... There was nothing I could do. Nothing. We were all devastated. We couldn't, um... We couldn't believe that, that it was actually happening. This story has literally been years in the making. We've been following the private agony of an Australian couple caught in a legal nightmare after Dubai's insane property boom collapsed. What's happened to them is shocking, but it's also had to remain a secret. Now, for the first time, Marcus and Julie Lee tell their story. foreign correspondent came to Dubai to examine the wreckage of a spectacular commercial crash. The global financial crisis had reached the United Arab Emirates and popped Dubai's bubble. There are thousands and thousands of uh, unfinished properties lying around on the desert, uh, unattended. Uh, people either just dumped them 
uh, or they can't make the payments. You know, it's a big uh, dilemma for everybody now. If you had an inkling of how Dubai deals with financial failure and you had the money for an airfare, you left your expensive car in the airport car park and bolted. One French businessman had even dressed as an Emirati woman to escape a deal gone wrong and fled by boat. When they put you in jail, it's not for three or five years. They put you in jail until you pay what they want you to pay. So if you don't pay or if you cannot pay, or you be regardless of the reason, they keep you in jail indefinitely. And you didn't have to be in prison to be trapped. Osman, how are you? Eric, Hi. yeah. So this is the room. This is where you all live. Yes, uh, 18 people living here. 18 people in this yes. room. Yes. Poor construction workers like these Bangladeshis couldn't leave Dubai. Their passports were in the hands of employers who hadn't paid wages for six months. Foolish, foolish ke bolle, foolish bolle koda dao. Bolle, okay na file tayari karo. One day, uh, we basically all turned up at work and that night the place had just collapsed. Overnight, the banks in Dubai basically stopped lending. Marcus Lee was one of many Australians caught up in the property crash. He was on the management team of a huge waterfront project owned by the state development company, Nikhil. But he and his wife, Julie Lee, decided to stay, convinced the bad times still held opportunity. There's two things that happen in development. When things are going good, uh, there's a lot of work to do. When things aren't going work, good, there's a lot of work to do as well. it would turn out to be the worst decision of their lives. They were about to become ensnared in a harrowing legal drama over a multi-million dollar property deal. The stakes were huge and so were the players. A billionaire sheikh, his all-powerful property company Nikhil, and an Australian developer, Sunland. On Australia Day 2009, police invited Marcus Lee downtown for a few questions. Yeah, well, their first question was, um, do you know why you're here? And I said, no, I don't know why I'm here. Then they started to ask me, do I know this person and this person and this person, names that I'd never heard of before, um, and certainly people I hadn't met. And I said, well, no, I don't know. And then I started to get a little bit concerned where one of the more senior guys uh, looked at me and looked a bit frustrated and said, you're lying. And uh, so I thought at that point, yes, this is going to be a, a different day. Marcus was thrown into a cell at National Security Headquarters, unaware of what he was supposed to have done. I was kept in solitary for a bit over two months, um, where I basically didn't even have a bathroom. We're back to real basics there. It was a room, 2.5 metres by 1.5 metres, it had a bed in it, it had a mattress on building blocks, if you call that a bed. It had a hole in the bottom of the door where I was fed three times a day and mostly food that I couldn't eat. And basically at that point I was cut off from anybody, denied legal representation, um, denied to contact Julie, to at least tell her where I've gone, what's happened. Um, and it was just nothing other than torturous conditions. Julie Lee was at her mother's 80th birthday party in Australia when she got news of his arrest. She flew straight back but was allowed only a brief phone call once a week. We try and walk, work together and try and say, OK, be strong, keep going, keep going. And then we'd say, OK, they're taking the phone away. And you'd say, I love you, I love you. And then that would be it. And then I'd keep trying to find out more information and that was all I'd ever get from Marcus, just those few minutes. In the filthy conditions and still in the dark about the accusations against him, 
Marcus soon contracted gastroenteritis and pneumonia, all made worse by severe asthma. Denied proper food and medicine, he fell gravely ill. Once you got ill, you were on your own. You had to fend for yourself. It was either that or getting moved to the main police hospital, which apparently was worse than the detention centre. I got to the point where I had a temperature of about 103 and it was one of those points when delirium sets in and you're, you're fearful for your life at that point. When Julie finally saw him, she realised he was dying. He'd lost about over 10% of his body weight. This was in seven weeks or less. Mm. He um, was severely dehydrated and there was something else as well. Oh, your blood pressure, that's mm -hmm. right. It was extreme. And... And one of the tests started to... Uh, we found out later that I was actually... Um, my body was closing down, mm. relying a lot on its uh, fatty tissues, so I was actually starting to urinate blood. Julie managed to get him antibiotics that saved his life. But he was still desperately sick when he was moved from solitary to a general detention centre. Yeah, well, there was everything from petty thieves and check bouncers um, to um, we had a group of serial killers in there. So to, to be one of the only Westerners, and I think there was about four Westerners in there, it was quite a daunting thing to come out of a room where there was severe psychological trauma. I, I, I can say that now, like a year and a half down the track. One of those Westerners was Marcus Lee's former boss, Matt Joyce, another Australian who'd brought his family to Dubai to ride the boom time. He'd worked with Marcus on the Dubai Waterfront project, owned by the state developer, Nikhil. But even he couldn't tell Marcus why they were there. No, it was very confusing, very confusing. Marcus and I would talk at hours and length of trying to establish what was going on. So you just really had no idea what, what you were supposed no, to be doing? No, we got snippets of information um, as much as we could and we tried to piece it together. But it was very confusing. We effectively had no idea, Eric. In desperation, Julie called Marcus's oldest friend in Australia, Rosemary Adams, a psychologist and businesswoman with a knack for getting things done. She flew straight to Dubai and went straight to the jail to see Marcus. He couldn't walk without holding onto the walls. He'd lost masses of weight, you know, he's really thin. His skin was a grey green colour, it was just horrible. Because don't forget their jails aren't, you don't get out in the air, you don't see any life or anything. You're in, it's all inside because it's 45 degrees outside. So you're in a room, you know, with walls, walls and ceilings. Matt, he was healthier than Marcus, but he was um, obviously very distressed. He was, fr he was frantic actually at times, you know, and so he, because he was talking to me because it's a bit where he could, um, but his wife also visited him every day too. Mm, and so. at that stage, the other thing is that none of us knew what was going on. There's no charges. We didn't know what it was about. Two months later and still without charges, Marcus Lee and Matt Joyce were sent to Dubai's main prison. It was so overcrowded, they had to share a bed. It was a, just a riot. It was a 24 hour a day riot. And basically, when things started to fly, you ducked. If you didn't duck, you'd get hit. <laughs> and just hope you weren't on side of the other side of some of the fights. Um, but even when I used to call Julie on the telephone, sometime a fight would break out and Julie would even be able to hear it on the other end. Um, one of the times actually I was even on a telephone and I got knocked off the telephone and the telephone just left there hanging. Julie could hear this ruckus happening in the background of another fight that I wasn't involved in, but I just got cleaned up in the process. And, God knows what that was like for Julie to just hear a fight happening on the other end of a prison. And when I'm talking a fight here, there's no schoolyard pushing. It's like literally people grabbing whatever they could, um, metal trays.